So good morning everyone. So my name is Pushkar Sonar. I take care of marketing at Vector. You must have received some part of communication from my end in last few weeks. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. I, we know it's a working day, but we have a very interesting and insightful session, full day lined up for all of you. Uh, I would like to welcome my colleagues over here. So you, you'll see all the Vector colleagues around. They will also introduce themselves across, but if we could just have everyone on the stage. I'll just, I'm just taking this opportunity before we start at 9.30, so that at least you know who all is going to interact with you. So uh, we have Harikishan over here, and Harikishan can introduce the complete team. 
we, we have colleagues from across the country coming over here. We have Srinivas who has come in from Hyderabad. We have Harish who is there. He's our technical expert as well, based in uh, Bangalore. We have Prasanna as well. We have Avinash. All of and them are Arun. based in Bangalore. We have Arun. And finally, we also have Harikishan over here. Harikishan is our business development manager. And he would be also interacting with all of us. Uh, I think he covers two odd sessions today, right? Yeah. So you'll be hearing from all of them today. Uh, and please feel free to ask any questions that you have during the session as well. We have good amount of time kept for Q&A as well. So please do interact. Uh, anything that you would want to see, you also can see at the end, you have got demo areas set up. So you'll be having the solutions ready over there. So during the breaks, during lunch time, also post the sessions if you really want to interact on something, see some functionality, we'll be happy to help you with the same. So please feel free to connect with either of us. We are always available over here for you. And uh, thank you once again. Uh, over to you, Harina. Okay. Hello. Good morning. Okay. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, welcome to Vector Software Test Symposium 2023. So, uh, to give a brief uh, about Vector, Vector is a uh, basically a tools company but we are into consulting and we help achieve your business problems and uh, mainly supporting safety critical systems. We are uh, supporting automotive solutions for the past 35 years, uh, uh, just two months short of uh, 35. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and other than that, we support other safety critical industries as well, uh, medical, aut uh, aerospace, and uh, even industrial uh, solutions also we support. So, uh, coming back to this uh, day, so the, the theme is uh, how technical debt uh, is, uh, is affecting software, uh, uh, software of safety critical systems and uh, how vector tools can help you uh, achieve your goals for your business problems. So, that is the theme and uh, the flow is going to the initial session. This is my session, first session. It is going to be full of problems. So I am going to scare you down <laughs> with a couple of problems, and the next, the the next coming upcoming sessions will have the solutions for this problem from a tools perspective, like how Vectorcast solves certain business problem and how PCLint Plus solves certain business problems and how Vectorcast QA is used, and lastly score. So this is the flow of this session, and. Uh, uh, we can uh, start start the session, yeah. Okay, so as you see, the title is technical debt and challenges in uh, safety critical systems. So, technical debt uh, to be to start a story, uh, there is this uh, person called uh, Ward Cunningham. He is credited to coining this uh, uh, this term called technical debt. So. It happens to be like uh, Ward Cunningham, way back in 1992, he was a software engineer in a, uh, and he was tasked to develop Ycash uh, portfolio management system. And they, his bosses being uh, uh, f completely in financial uh, portfolio, they asked him a question like, uh, how come software uh, needs maintenance? It is not in hardware, it is not a car where you run for 10,000 kilometers and you have to go to service station or nothing like that. How come I need to do the maintenance? Why is it? Then uh, he thought about, like, he came up with metaphor. Uh, like all metaphors, technical debt uh, is, a, uh, is coined in such a way that to model against our financial debt. How financial debt you take to uh, solve uh, certain problems, so you will pay back with interest to the bankers. So just that way, like car loan, personal loan, and home loan, just like that, technical debt is modeled in, in that fashion. That is the background of the story. Let's uh, start with the session. Okay. This is the agenda of this uh, uh, session. Okay. So let's start with the definition. Uh, so technical debt is a, a term basically used for any uh, anything that we cut corners to achieve uh, 
software delivery milestones. So just to uh, uh, get, get to the milestone, like we have a delivery date. So we often hear this term saying like, if we don't do this release, there, there may not be next release. So to achieve this kind of things, we normally skip some, uh, some things or uh, uh, software development team eating into the budget of uh, testing team. So certain test cases or non-critical components are tested in next releases. So these kind of things all fall into technical debt only. So like any other debt, you have to uh, again repay it with interest. So the interest would be the bloating of software and uh, software entropy will come into place and uh, you will the software becomes so huge and uh, so unmaintainable at certain point you have to drop the variant or drop the program and start again one more time so in, instead of reusability so in short anything you are uh, worrying about runtime capabilities and you are not worrying about design time uh, qualities that, that is when technical debt enters okay so just this definition is uh, uh, is for you uh, technical debt is uh, uh, delayed technical work in pursuit of milestones. Okay. So uh, I am going to touch upon Deming's theory. Deming's theory, uh, Edward Deming came up with this theory uh, and he is credited to uh, bringing around Toyota story. So uh, Edward Deming came up with this theory saying that any organization which uh, concentrates on uh, like uh, reducing cost will end up uh, reducing quality and in turn uh, that escalates to increase in cost in long run. So better to increase, improve the quality which as a side, positive side effects will be uh, a reduction in cost. That is what Edward uh, Deming's theory. So and uh, the guy who I am talking about, Ward Cunningham is the one in uh, photo. So this is the classification of technical debt based on execution and intention. Like uh, uh, this is uh, the initial classification that has been done uh, way back in 90s. So the classification is, uh, you can see uh, Mark Fowler's uh, uh, quadrant which, uh, which defines technical debt whether it is uh, based on the intention and then the context later. Intention is like whether uh, it is done deliberately or it is it is done uh, without unknowingly and uh, uh, again the, the next phase is like recklessness or prudent recklessness is like okay we'll see it later that is recklessness prudent is like i'll do the test next sprint of this component uh, so that is like you know which which test you have to do so that is like prudent you you know what to do uh, and uh, just to go through these uh, terms, intentional is like you know what you are doing, you are just taking uh, some time, like you are this certain component is not important in this software release, so you are not going to test that or you are not going to implement that, you will write down, uh, you, you will document that in either your Jira tasks or your uh, uh, rational, so uh, rational tools you will use and you will document that as a CR or uh, change request later later to be implemented that is intentional unintentional is uh, uh, normally like when a entry level programmer has uh, done a bad code uh, or uh, uh, something like that is unintentional and short term is the one which i said next sprint will do that so that kind of thing is short term long term is uh, when you plan for uh, like there is no uh, variant coming up for the next five years so we can uh, we, we need not worry about reusability so that is uh, long term and uh, focused is unfocused is again like you want to uh, do this uh, you want to limit this uh, testing for the next release or something like that and environmental debt this is something uh, you can't plan for uh, see you have uh, uh, adopted like you have uh, your organization has acquired some some organization and they have so much technical debt uh, or so much bad code and that has come to your organization and your team is tasked to update uh, uh, certain uh, change requests. So you, when you hit that uh, updation phase and you check, the code is so bad that when you fix certain part, uh, 
certain other parts fail. So you end up doing, uh, the plan might be for say two weeks to fix that code, but you end up doing like six months or seven months. So that kind of thing is environmental debt that you can't plan for. So this is the latest classification. Though the technical debt term has been uh, uh, there for a while, uh, it has been uh, from 90s, but recently it has picked up so much traction and so much research material is available and so many organizations and universities are uh, uh, into this research. And uh, one of the prominent research that affects our safety critical uh, software is uh, uh, related to one Sweden university, uh, Chalmers University. And they have come up with this uh, uh, classification based on nature and which phase of software development this uh, technical debt comes up. So due to, uh, as this is big research topic, I don't want to touch upon every each and every topic. I will just touch upon like important parts of this. Important parts of this is architectural debt. Uh, architectural debt is the main uh, reason why anything like this uh, comes into play. So uh, uh, see the structure itself is bad. The programmer, however good they might be, they might end up uh, putting multiple dependencies and uh, uh, each failure will result in multiple other failures. So uh, that, is, that is one of the uh, thing. Uh, so architecture debt is very important for any organization to plan for. And uh, next thing is build debt. Build debt is uh, in your make file system or any uh, whoever is still using make files. So that uh, make file, some, sometimes we end up writing multiple dependencies that are uh, not needed. So the building uh, time will increase drastically. So that is unwanted in certain scenarios where distributed systems are there and automatically some building and some testing has to happen. This is very important. In uh, standalone cases where it is a small team and uh, uh, this may not affect them much. And coming to code debt, this is, uh, this is everywhere, source code debt. Uh, to one of the things that you can do, the one of the indicators for the source code debt is like uh, any static analysis tools, if you are using so many uh, warnings uh, all coming up on your code and unfixed uh, errors and warnings, all those things. Uh, errors, we fix it because without that, we can't build the code, but warnings, we ignore it most of the times. So that end up being, uh, over a period of time, that end up being a bad code and uh, unmaintainable code. So that is the code debt. And design debt uh, is more about uh, uh, like uh, inheritance, uh, uh, some uh, uh, dependencies we have created and the interface is uh, pretty bad where uh, buggy interface, all these things comes under design debt. Test debt is uh, coverage not complete, unexecuted test cases, and there are manual tests sometimes in iterations. Uh, this happens in display testing. Sometimes uh, uh, engineers get bored and they just say this has been tested <laughs> as it is manual. So they just uh, write it down as tested, but uh, you see that this is uh, some issue might come up in uh, later. This is all uh, test debt. Okay, now uh, we have talked about technical debt quite a while uh, and we need to know how it affects, uh, I guess most of uh, them here uh, are uh, concerned about safety critical uh, software. So uh, we, uh, you worried about like uh, following some standards. So uh, I just took out uh, uh, IEC 61508, which is like a base standard for so safety critical uh, software. So based on that only ISO standard and ISO 26262 and again uh, EN 50128 for uh, railways, all these things are based on. So I took the flow of uh, safety critical uh, 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 software here. Uh, I'll just touch on how the flow is. Uh, it will be very crisp. Uh, the flow is normally we get a customer requirement or uh, we, we try to develop certain part, um, uh, ECU in automotive, LRU, or maybe CCU in railways. So all these controllers or something, we, we try to build some certain unit and uh, that has some requirements from customer that we want to other. Then comes risk and uh, hazard analysis. There we decide on uh, what safety requirements will flow through. Like what is the safety element that to be implemented that we decide upon. 
and that safety requirements are flowed down. So this high level requirements are broken down into uh, lower level uh, requirements. Uh, some end up uh, for uh, hardware, some end up for uh, 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 safety cases and some end up for uh, uh, performance requirement, some for uh, software implementation. So this is the flow, how it goes. And for this, verification and validation is one of the important thing. And again, uh, uh, um, like, uh, 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 like implementation also, there is maintenance, uh, even uh, commissioning is also very important, important thing. Uh, right, the end of thing, you have to, there will be multiple distributed systems in, uh, 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 in places like in aerospace, uh, teams will be distributed across continents and across time zones. Uh, even with railways, there will be multiple vendors, even uh, automotive. So uh, all these things have to be commissioned and the maintenance also we have to bear. So this is the workflow of uh, uh, safety critical uh, uh, development. Uh, it can be mission critical systems like uh, NASA's uh, space thing or uh, uh, again uh, uh, business critical solution like uh, it could be like uh, consumer electronics. Uh, where uh, you are uh, trying to do something like if any any issue comes that is for huge loss of value and they would not buy that product again and uh, other safety critical systems or automotive aerospace medical so how technical debt is important in safety critical scenario so uh, based on the research these are the three critical questions that is to be asked in any organization uh, to talk about technical debt. Most of the times what happens is uh, software quality is talked about very much. Verification and validation is given uh, very much importance in organization. But technical debt is one such topic which uh, is just emerging and uh, we, need to, uh, we need to give special attention to this topic. So based on the research, these are the three critical questions uh, that were uh, posed. And one is, uh, any technical debt needs to be refactored. Refactoring is a term used for uh, uh, implementing, like you're reducing your debt. Just like financial debt, how you pay off your EMIs or uh, how you pay off, uh, uh, pay off certain uh, principal. So just like that, uh, technical debt refactoring is the term used for repayment of that uh, debt. So what happens is, instead of uh, changing the entire source code behavior, uh, we will do small and small changes to do the design level and uh, we are, uh, we are uh, worrying about qualitative uh, behaviorals instead of runtime behaviors. So runtime behavior should stay same and uh, qual qualitative behavior should change. So that is what refactoring is all about. So the first question, first critical question is whether this technical debt refactoring is costlier in safety critical, uh, uh, safety critical software. If it is costly, because safety critical is uh, again uh, recertification, uh, if any changes we do, we have to go through recertification and requalification. So if it is costly, we just ignore it and uh, we try to, uh, ultimately we need it certified and we need it to be in market, it need to be safe. So we implement the safety thing, but we don't worry about uh, uh, future something is going to come say uh, a sprint is planned for uh, two weeks, but uh, the task of that sprint goes on to next sprint and next sprint and next sprint. So when we actually calculate the estimate versus the plan versus the actual, it will be a huge difference. Uh, when you dig down why this is happening, the reason would be uh, the uh, dependencies, multiple dependencies, when you edit certain part of code, so something unrelated is failing, when you go and try to update that, you need to again test that part of the code which was not in the planning at all. So this kind of thing can make, uh, so all these parts have to be recertified again. So this can make TD refactoring a costly affair in safety critical system. So we have to ask this question. And the second question is whether our, uh, uh, there is this, uh, uh, this, 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 this idea in uh, almost all the safety critical systems that we are implementing uh, uh, as per the standard. Say in aerospace, you ask an aerospace guy, he says like we are uh, following Devo 178C, so we will not have uh, any issue. Our software is perfect. But uh, 
even there there is uh, an issue of planning again uh, whatever is planned that is not being achieved so that that problem exists there as well and uh, the same thing with other industries as well so this question uh, uh, this this thing like this idea that safety critical uh, uh, regulations is going to limit the technical debt is not valid anymore so this second question is also honestly has to be discussed upon and uh, sometimes if uh, the the processes if the in the organization or in the team can be good so uh, but what happens is there is a tailoring mechanism even though the central process is very good each team due to milestone they'll do the tailoring and they do it they take a deviation there is no track of all the deviations that is taken for each project uh, in an organization so you end up becoming multiple organizations in a single organizations each having their own process so that is uh, that is some something that uh, need to be worked upon so let's move to the next thing so this is moore's curve uh, it talks about like at the uh, at after certain point if you try to add uh, more people in in the team to solve the like it is the same thing like uh, uh, there is this joke right we say if you have uh, nine people can the pregnancy be limited to one month each or something like that so this is the moore's curve is like that if you see after that point after the point that is given here so after that point that in that curve every person you add in the team is going to increase the number of days needed to complete the milestone then decrease so this is uh, this is something uh, we need to work upon and why can't we we, we talked about technical data a lot so why can't we limit it like why can't we prevent it altogether so we bring in best process and why can't we just uh, limit it altogether for that these four are are the reason one is ambiguity and requirements uh, say take a railways example uh, bid is sent uh, to uh, 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 bid is sent and bid has to be won and then only the uh, the implementation and all will will follow through but the bid uh, needs to uh, align with the requirements requirements are given by some uh, government organization or some some organization that uh, only gives the requirements vaguely so based on that each uh, competitor works on so everyone needs to first win the bid then only they can implement so in the race to win the bid we will say yes to all uh, that can happen and uh, the uh, the implementers or the safety team when they work upon the requirements the requirements are so ambiguous that they can't implement completely and they'll push on to achieve the deadline so this is one possibility and the other possibility is distributed systems which are uh, uh, in multiple countries and multiple cultural things comes in multiple time zones and the collaboration is uh, is a problem sometimes so that also can lead to ambiguity of requirements and uh, uh, so that can result in uh, uh, missing some of the things that needs to be done and diversity of projects is multiple projects at multiple uh, uh, different uh, degree of uh, criticality and different degree of complexity so when one one project uh, learnings are uh, if a deviation is taken from standard template of an organization that the learnings of this project may not be completely applicable to the other project where another deviation is taken so that is also one of the issue and inadequate knowledge management so this is uh, this is something where every organization uh, faces uh, there might be couple of experts who who are uh, um, so much uh, who has spent so many years in the organization and learned the pro product so much and the dependency on them is uh, is so much that they they have to come and solve so many issues that is the and uh, and moreover in safety critical systems most of the things will be proprietary uh, proprietary uh, units and uh, those things might not be available in google or website for you to learn uh, so that is that is one more uh, uh, issue and resource constraint there can be a very expensive hardware that needs to be used for testing 
So, uh, teams has to work around the clock or take shifts uh, to complete that task. So, that is also one of the issue that, uh, that limits us to prevent the technical debt altogether. So, it is fine. Technical debt is a problem and uh, we cannot eliminate it completely. Then what is the solution? So, solution is refactoring. So, refactoring is like again as we discussed, refactoring is a term used for uh, addressing your issues uh, by small and incremental steps without, uh, without changing the code behavior, what it is. So, this is one scenario which is considered like uh, this is a use case that is considered. Uh, say a company A is uh, implementing telematics uh, for variant Y based on their already existing uh, variant X. So, the reuse claimed during the planned phase uh, of the components of X is 100 percent. So, uh, they are very confident that uh, uh, the X variants, all the software components can be used completely. So, we are not going to worry about uh, 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 changes in the X variant software components. So, 100 percent reuse was planned in the planning phase. So, the budget was allocated in such a way for man hours or uh, say number of days or uh, anything and certain uh, number of engineers were allocated and uh, the, the X variant software is qualified and certified. So, uh, anyone if, if it is uh, willing to answer, do you think it is possible to achieve this thing 100 percent reusability based on your experience? Anyone can say yes confidently, the 100 percent reusability is a possibility uh, if in your work experience. I remember uh, <laughs> one project which there is uh, no reusability. Uh, only the even though 100 percent was claimed, it was only 5 percent that was reused. So, what what is the challenge in in this scenario? This is the scenario very common in organizations uh, uh, nowadays. So there is a legacy code, and we try to use it, and uh, we want to uh, build up on on top of that. But uh, we end up uh, spending more time than uh, developing from scratch. So what is the challenge? So, these are the four challenges that are listed. One is uh, unstable interface. There is a any software will have multiple components and uh, co software or hardware multiple interfaces to all the components and there can be a buggy interface. Uh, if you see the to check what is the history of that uh, uh, X variant project, if they were if anyone had worked upon the history of all the git uh, tasks and check the what is uh, the past uh, thing, how much uh, is uh, change, how many changes has been done on each interface. There might be one or two interfaces or maybe very handful of interfaces where multiple iterations of changes had been done. So, that is something called unstable interface. Any additions or additions to that is going to be even uh, uh, tough to regulate and even tough to work upon. So, modularity uh, violation. So, this is uh, uh, say uh, there is a change, change, change request has come and a certain part of code has been updated and totally unrelated uh, module that will get affected. Uh, this happens more than uh, a couple of times. So, this is something called implicit modularity conversion. So, this is a problem that exists in, uh, in uh, if the code is not uh, uh, is very proper or if, the, if there is a certain technical debt in the code. And improper inheritance is one more challenge in, in this kind of reusability where uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, say like client, some client, some subclass is, uh, is uh, some parent class is dependent on uh, uh, subclass or uh, say <coughs> some client is dependent, uh, some client which is using uh, inheritance uh, is uh, dependent on both the parent and subclass. So, this kind of uh, improper inheritance is also one of the uh, challenge to have 100 percent reuse or anything and uh, cyclic dependency. So, this is 
this is also one more thing which uh, you face. So, these are all fine. What are your recommendations uh, for for uh, uh, for bettering the software? So, everything is uh, a small and incremental step. We can't change the complete software in day one and uh, um, become the best of it. It is going to be in iterative cycles which we have to uh, do it. So, what are the recommendations uh, from our side is like baselining the software uh, is one of the best thing you can do. Uh, a software can be baseline and uh, uh, you can have a set of test cases which can be uh, which can be made completely automatic and uh, that baseline software after every change uh, you can have this overnight builds or automate in uh, say CI CD pipeline and then uh, uh, as soon as a change happens uh, the, the certain automated tests will execute overnight without any uh, engineer's intervention and you can get which part of the code is, uh, uh, is affected and all these things can happen. So, baselining is a very good uh, um, thing that we see working in some of our customers. So, this is one of the recommendations which we would uh, give from our side and uh, this, this is uh, uh, the second recommendation is based on the architecture. Uh, this is this one uh, worked out in one of the projects which I worked in. So, this is a partitioning. Uh, certain RTOS like uh, support uh, uh, partitioning and you can even partition uh, hardware wise as well. You can implement the, mo uh, the variant, bivariant extra features in separate uh, 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 processor piggybacking it. So, load sharing can happen. So, that also is possible. So, this partitioning also limits uh, your chance of certifying say uh, telematics unit where it is using. Uh, if it is the, the uh, future is like you want to have it in autonomous driving and you want to then the telematics uh, safety criticality ASIL level goes way high up. So, then uh, the new features has to be certified according to that. So, this is one of the recommendations which we would give. And uh, uh, next thing is uh, uh, yeah, uh, and metrics is very important for uh, tracking technical debt. So, any metrics that you uh, tra uh, define and track uh, is very uh, useful. So, that will give you where you are standing currently and uh, your future picture and uh, in future you can check whether the your implementation activities has been uh, fruitful or not. So, that is one thing which you can do iteratively. So, metrics are important. Uh, we will talk about this thing metrics a uh, little bit more. So, next thing is uh, this is even bigger uh, that is just for a demonstration how the annual budget uh, looks and then uh, what actually happens in the uh, in the down like we plan for something and uh, we end up spending more time on uh, uh, unplanned things that that happens. So, uh, so uh, considering uh, TD refactoring, uh, again uh, it is like small incremental steps uh, how we have to manage. Any debt has to be serviced. So, uh, this technical debt management is a process how intuitively we decide upon certain decision making to solve that issue and so that it will not, uh, uh, it will not feature in uh, uh, again and again it was it is an improvement for the engineers as well so we learn along the way okay okay so these are the consequences and effects of uh, uh, regulations uh, when planning for uh, td refactoring so consequences are uh, often talked about like uh, uh, in safety critical the documentation is very important because evidence has to be provided to the uh, qualifier whoever comes external authority or internal auditors all this evidences are very important. So, any changes we have to change the documentation. So, that is a consequence and additional documentation is uh, is painful uh, I, uh, that is that is one thing and additional simulation uh, additional executions and additional tests risk assessment has to be changed your risk uh, uh, matrix has to be aligned to that. So, test scope changes. So, these are the consequences, Effective, effect, uh, effects of this are uh, way uh, higher 
in in the cost benefit analysis when you do for t, uh, uh, technical data refactoring you have to consider the effects as well in man hours that help you uh, address the issues so the effects are like uh, the in future when the maintenance cycle will be uh, very easy and uh, maintenance will uh, will be very smoothful and the planning your planning versus uh, uh, actual will not be having much variance uh, okay so this is uh, uh, this is what uh, the flow for uh, uh, flow has for the research that i was talking about <coughs> sorry so any technical debt refactoring cost benefit analysis is normally done and refactoring decision making is done normally in management meeting and uh, most of the times if the cost cost side is the focus uh, in this kind of discussions so that will be ignored most of the times or some workarounds will be suggested so workarounds are most of the times uh, <coughs> sorry will end up being hurting more than uh, saving at uh, that present time okay so let's uh, uh, talk about the best practices that we have uh, from our side so <coughs> the main uh, best practice that uh, that we suggest is create an awareness to all the stakeholders in uh, organization software quality has has a team and that is uh, going to the highest levels uh, in any organization just like that uh, technical debt has also we uh, talked about and create an awareness about that and uh, stakeholders has to be uh, decided upon and uh, all the deviations that are present in any uh, uh, any uh, say uh, project 1 project 2 project 3 e, uh, two projects have taken deviation from standard uh, uh, practices of the organization that has to be documented in a central repository where this thing can be tracked and <clears throat> after the project a discussion can happen and uh, the uh, it can be uh, refactoring can be happening so that is one best practice so if initially we can talk about it then we can uh, solve the problem so that is the first best practice and the second thing is embrace the agile software development practices <coughs> like uh, 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 iteratively small steps agile demands us to have more automation and have uh, uh, iteratively solve the issues and uh, it demands us demands the software team to have uh, multiple release cycles uh, so that demands us to automate our manual process so embracing the agile software development process is one of the best practice suggestion and uh, linking that if you see in this uh, first one the second thing is to do's you might have seen uh, uh, to do's in your code uh, hashtag to do's uh, like uh, we'll write we'll put the comment and we'll ri we'll write it uh, uh, we'll write it like we'll solve it next sprint so if you see here there is written like uh, commented consider generating a constructor that doesn't make sense uh, unless you go into that code and dwell upon just by seeing that uh, to do or if you extract that to do uh, using some uh, python automation or anything that doesn't make sense at all so you will not be able to uh, get anything from that uh, uh, to do so the second thing is a better one so refactor to the module name and uh, refactor the jira task or uh, whatever the mechanism you use uh, so that is that is the uh, best thing you can Uh, that is the best practice recommendation from us so the next thing is uh, uh, encourage the engineers to talk about uh, the issues uh, that is that is present and uh, instead of penalizing them it has to be uh, encouraged so that uh, they they will come up in the first place so that that can be addressed uh, instead of when uh, fire catches calling the fire engine better to be safe and have all the uh, amenities in the place so perform cost benefit analysis uh, in the view of having a better software than to uh, uh, than to postpone an activity that is that is one more best best practice and follow the metrics uh, uh, adopt any metrics that is suitable for your needs 
uh, if you uh, need any uh, help regarding your use case for consultation, uh, we are happy to help. Uh, which metrics would uh, help you better? That we are more than happy to help. Uh, and uh, there are many metrics like scale, uh, code coverage, and cyclometric complexity, uh, uh, all these things. And uh, so baselining again, last but not least, baselining your software with um, automated tests that will help you. So that is uh, what uh, this session is all about. And uh, next sessions that follow will have, this is more, I, I know I have uh, uh, bombarded with technical data a lot. And uh, next sessions will have a demo and actual use cases like how you can uh, solve these problems. We have talked about technical debt and refactoring and how even safety critical uh, software has a technical debt problem. So next uh, session uh, is about uh, uh, how uh, Jenkins and uh, CICD, uh, continuous integration. So you have a Jenkins demo as well uh, after that. And uh, the session following that is uh, PCLint Plus. This uh, helps you with uh, uh, code violations and uh, uh, all these things. That has the demo as well. And uh, the other uh, 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 session uh, following PCLint Plus is Vectorcast with uh, Test Insights, where you can, uh, you can work in collaborative way and how baseline testing uh, you can do. That is using change-based testing. That is the session later. Last, lastly, uh, and the session following that is vector cache QA. If you have your own uh, test environment, that can be uh, integrated with vector cache and uh, can be automated. That is uh, the session. And the last session is score. Uh, it is an analytics tool. Uh, that's my time. Any questions? Yes. No, this uh, this is a software problem uh, mostly. So the tools are uh, software tools. So the equipment uh, is uh, the uh, the software tools. Software tools. Yeah. Uh, any uh, examples of uh, typical metrics uh, one would define for tracking this uh, uh, technical, technical debt? debt. Okay. Uh, that depends on uh, what kind of projects you are working on and what are the issues that you face. Uh, normally metrics are defined to address your uh, uh, or, uh, issue that is faced in your organization. There are multiple metrics. One of the effective metrics is uh, <coughs> say man hours, how many, uh, uh, how many man hours is needed to fix this code. And the code violations, static analysis code violations, that is one uh, good metric. And the scale is also one of the good metrics, uh, software quality in uh, uh, life cycle. That is, uh, that is one more uh, 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 good metric. And there are multiple metrics. So based on your use case, uh, what is a good metric? So you should be facing with some problem, uh, right, uh, uh, in multiple iterations. And uh, over a period of time, your uh, software should be facing some problems, whether it is architecture. Based on that, we can define your uh, metrics. Code coverage is one metric, and cyclometric complexity is one metric, and uh, uh, so all these things are there. Uh, uh, what I'm struggling to understand is like, uh, see, some of this, what are you told about code coverage or uh, some of this violations and all, we might need to fix it at one point of the time, uh, and you are talking about refactoring, yeah. right? Maybe at that point of time, some of them might have been, and we need to mandatorily close them for the standard complaints for whatever, right? I'm more thinking about the technical depth, what the classifications you gave on various uh, uh, fronts, and how to track them with some metrics. Because what are the tools you talked about, PC Lint and Vectorcast, those are very uh, standard tools for the standard complaints. What are the standards we follow uh, for whatever the target markets those are, right? Mm. Uh, my, where I'm struggling is like uh, maybe the to dos, right? Maybe mm. that is one thing I might try, but that's that's uh, uh, yeah maybe very rudimentary one uh, okay. to start. You with. You are talking about this classification. <coughs> yeah, if you keep this in the background, what are the different metrics one can define to really track uh, what is the architectural debt or uh, say code debt or 
various types of debt, right? Uh, this each one is a separate uh, stream again. So that's why I have uh, put a uh, note saying uh, each one is a uh, separate uh, um, uh, stream of topic which takes a separate session for each one. That's why just to limit the time, I have uh, touched upon only on important things and given certain indicators over there. If you see uh, for architectural debt, uh, it is a very vague thing. Issues in software architecture is uh, because uh, I couldn't uh, quantify uh, it with uh, certain aspects because uh, for generic uh, generalization, uh, certain issues might be applicable for you and certain might not be. That's why I mentioned just issues in uh, software architecture. And modularity is one, uh, one thing that uh, I, I gave example. Now how uh, to quantize this? See, uh, I, I understand like uh, architecture debt might be the biggest among all. I think you yes. also emphasize that. Let's talk in specifics, right? Uh, I'm still struggling how, yeah, maybe I know like it's not modular, but how do I quant quant quantize it or quantify it for me to come up with a metric and also to track it further, right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, say uh, you have a, a certain uh, class or uh, say you have certain functions and certain file and uh, uh, you have your Git history, right, which is being modified. And, uh, and it, you can track it uh, with along with the Jira for sprint and the task as well. So when you connect both things for each updation and each testing cycle, which are the very frequently uh, updated one? That is, that is one thing to uh, point, one of the metrics you can follow. Uh, if you ask, how can I track this uh, uh, in, in current scenario, you have to use multiple tools uh, like no one fit uh, solution for all the things or if you have any specific example we can discuss more uh, uh, later also okay. uh, if you have any specific example like this this issue i faced uh, this uh, while fixing this part of code i had this issue if you have anything specific example we can discuss more okay i know this is too much generalized and you wanted specifics i get that and if there is any specific example you have, we'll, we can discuss it more. Uh, yeah. Any any more questions? Jira is a right? Yes. That is uh, just to track uh, uh, bugs and all. Uh, it is not like I endorse Jira or anything. I was saying Jira or any rational tool or uh, anything. Uh, IBM also has uh, uh, tools. So anything that you, any uh, bug tracking tool uh, is what I was talking about. Any, anything else? Uh, please feel free to ask any questions even later also. Uh, we are available here. So if you have, uh, if you need any uh, personalized discussion also. Uh, I'll be sitting in the back uh, after this session. You can reach out. Even after uh, this, se this session today also, if you have anything, you can reach out to us. We are more than happy to help you. Yeah, that's my cue. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Okay, right. Uh, after the session on technical debt, uh, we would be, as we have explained before, we will be uh, moving slowly towards uh, the possible solutions that we have discussed as challenges in the previous session. So one of, uh, one of uh, uh, the challenges that we face in the embedded world especially is that how to adapt enterprise software development and testing paradigm into embedded systems, embedded software. So that is the topic of discussion of this particular presentation. So before I move further, I will be discussing about uh, what is the difference between the embedded uh, software development and testing and the enterprise software development. What is the key differences between that and then I'll be discussing about challenges of uh, adapting to Agile. Before that, we will be discussing about uh, why Agile. And then um, 
uh, we will be discussing the next uh, progression is uh, the continuous integration. We will be discussing what is continuous integration and uh, what are the challenges uh, we will be facing when we try to mag migrate from the traditional software development uh, life cycle, the famous V model into the, agi into the uh, agile and adapting into the CI, CD based uh, uh, build uh, systems. And finally, we will be discussing how these pieces fall in place and how Vectorcast can help you to expedite the process of migration from your traditional software development into the agile model, what we have to offer from Vector. So that is the agenda for this particular presentation. So before we move any further trying to understand uh, how we can uh, migrate uh, our software development uh, to CI, CD, we have to understand what is the difference between uh, the software development when it comes to uh, enterprise software development, what is the difference? So the key difference is that uh, enterprise software development uh, and embedded software development is that that uh, in the enterprise software you have a code uh, that is crunching numbers basically you have a lot of uh, data that you have to process uh, at a much faster rate so the, that is one example of an enterprise like you you can take any banking software it could be one example whereas when you are in an embedded uh, software development we are focused on doing some dedicated task or it could be a sub task of a bigger system and we have to do it redundantly continuously we have to do it so that is a key difference between uh, enterprise software development and uh, the embedded software development second thing is the examples you can take is the bank uh, software uh, you can take or you know like i have I put some examples here crm and ecm so these are some of the examples you can take uh, for an uh, enterprise software development. Whereas for embedded systems, uh, it could be a safety critical uh, or a mission critical software. It could be your airbag software. It could be your uh, software that uh, uh, puts uh, you know rocket into space. Okay, something that is mis mission critical or safety critical will uh, fall under embedded uh, software development. And uh, the main characteristics uh, of uh, uh, enterprise software is that we are not constrained, uh, there are no memory constraints as such. These softwares are designed to be run on servers, okay, or on a centralized system. Whereas in embedded uh, software, we are more focused on uh, the, you know, maintainability, fail safety, okay, and, uh, and also uh, reliability. So we are more focused on uh, these parameters when it comes to embedded development. And uh, enterprise development, they are always eager to embrace the newer technologies so that they can give a better quality. Uh, this is motivation. Whereas in embedded uh, uh, software development, we are more focused on uh, the reliability. We are also want to give cost effective solutions uh, to our customers. This is more focus in embedded uh, uh, software development. And why is that uh, we want to move uh, from the enterprise software to the embedded software development is that if you see, if you see 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, the hardwares were not uh, this powerful. Embedded hardwares were not this powerful and we didn't have this much big um, memory, uh, memory spaces in the embedded targets. But over the, if you see, best example is our smartphone. We are trying to cram in as much features as possible. Even our uh, cars have become smart now. So, and also the underlying hardware has become very powerful. So there, uh, even now, now, now it is the time for even for the embedded uh, software to move in, uh, into the enterprise software development paradigm. So that the particular, the, the line is becoming thinner and thinner when it comes to enterprise software development or embedded software development. So that is the main motivation uh, uh, to take up this topic.
Okay, uh, adoption of agile practices. Many companies uh, right now are adopting to agile um, software development paradigm. Now, why agile? So, if you see uh, many years ago, like uh, 20, 30 years ago, if you want to develop any software, you have you had some time like three years or four years. You had requirements, and uh, most of the times these requirements were stable. And after five years, we had a product. Now, right now, we have competing products, and the requirements may change, the features may change, even when the software is under development, based on the market requirements. So, we should be quickly able to change our uh, software uh, development, and we have, to, we have to make sure that we have quicker time to market because uh, there is a danger that you know by the time our product gets released the software gets released it may be already obsolete so that is the reason why uh, many of the companies are uh, moving towards agile uh, software uh, development uh, uh, development and testing now uh, we try to categorize uh, different kinds of uh, levels uh, when it comes to agile uh, the team level, the team at the team level, the more focus is on deliverable. So you have a software component, and you have to deliver it. So we call it in uh, this uh, uh, this agile uh, development. We call it as sprints. You uh, you have shorter sprints. You try to implement certain features, and you make sure that it is working as expected. So this is uh, called. Uh, they are more focused at the team level. They are more focused on delivering the uh, some cut. Uh, I'm sorry, they are more focused on fixing some bug uh, in, at the team level. At the program level, uh, we have what we call it as agile release trains, and they are more focused on software component uh, release. And the value stream level is something which is optional, where they will be trying to uh, use the same agile technology to have a common algorithms across multiple software developments and uh, portfolio level basically manages multiple software releases so, so this is the hierarchy so that is the lowest level team level is the lowest level and the highest level is the portfolio level and these are optional the value stream level and the portfolio level are the optional i'm sorry okay what are the other uh, other uh, uh, what are the other uh, what to say trends uh, in the software development is that adoption of dbms as you know even in the embedded targets right now we have to process a lot of data so embedded even in the embedded uh, uh, systems also we are adapting the dbms based uh, software development and prognostics again this is a new new trend where we want to have predictive diagnostics using uh, uh, the languages like uh, like using the concepts like machine learning and we also want to, we are also seeing that uh, use of AI, um, you know, uh, artificial intelligence as part of embedded uh, software development. Next thing is that now even embedded uh, software, al uh, software products also have web services. This is other, uh, other uh, trend. Uh, so we, uh, for example, best example is Internet of Things, IOTs they use the web services so these are some of the other trends that are uh, driving so okay we we talk, we spoke about current trends and uh, next uh, thing is challenges um, obviously uh, so if you want to really move towards agile uh, uh, agile software development what are the different challenges of course n right now uh, we all have this problem we have multinational software development teams so we have different teams they are sitting in uh, under in uh, different nations and they are working so that is one uh, uh, challenge of course the logical progression is time zone and uh, also the other cultural things like language and kt this is again a, a very big problem when in the software development how do we transfer the work that we have done uh, to our uh, counterparts effectively so that we they understand what we are talking about so this is another challenge here and uh, then uh, different teams working on different requirements 
and sometimes what happens is that they miss the big picture. So why we are working all together, we are working on this particular project. Uh, different teams have their own subset of requirements they are working on and because of that there will be integration problems. So when you bring all these different components, software components together, then uh, when you try to integrate these components, uh, then what we call in, uh, you know, loosely it's called as integration hell. So most of the time is wasted there when you try to integrate. So that is one of the, um, one of the challenges. And of course we have security and uh, concurrency. These are the uh, other uh, challenges that we may face. Next thing is that, you know, I want to implement agile, uh, agile, de agile uh, software development and testing. So wh what are the different ways I can do that? One of the ways is uh, we bring the development, testing and the IT together. Okay, uh, so this is the, uh, we get the best of all the, all the three, three domains. So that's what is called as a DevOps. In the DevOps, you have uh, your development engineers and uh, your testing uh, engineers and the IT together. So DevOps tool chain goal is that uh, you have the human col collaboration and uh, we, be in, as we have discussed uh, before in Agile, we should have the continuous delivery. So you implement subset of requirements and you go for the delivery and uh, the reliability. So if you make any changes to your software, you should be confident that the software change did not impact the ultimately your software product quality. So these are the founding stones for the DevOps. So this is one way of uh, you know implementing the CI. I'm sorry, Agile. Uh, and what is uh, continuous integration? Continuous integration is nothing but uh, loosely translated. You have a main trunk where you have to uh, upload your software and you will be implementing the uh, some subset of your requirement and you will be committing to com when I say committing you are actually uh, copying this uh, logic onto the main, main trunk so that's what is the continuous integration loosely translated next thing is okay uh, now I understand that uh, I have to uh, implement Agile, uh, we started with enterprise software and then we, we understood that you know embedded software is also moving in that direction. I understand that I have uh, Agile, uh, uh, I have to ad adapt Agile and then we spoke about what uh, one of the two things we have discussed about DevOps and uh, from the DevOps we have not discussed about CI. Now what are the challenges that we, uh, we uh, face, we may face when we try to adapt this particular software development and testing paradigm. So one thing is uh, we have discussed previously that uh, we have uh, in agile uh, so software development, we are more committed to uh, developing a subset of your requirements and then you are committing to the main trunk. So this is, could be one challenge. You could have, you need to have a mechanism where you have uh, the central uh, uh, s server and then you have your uh, teams working and finally they are uh, committing the software uh, to the main trunk. So this could, you have to figure out how this can be implemented. This could be one of the challenge uh, when you move towards uh, the CI. And uh, other things is that uh, there could be change in requirements. We spoke about that like uh, in Agile. Chances are that after we venture into software development, there could be changes in your requirement and uh, there could be bug fixes like, uh, be, you know, the bug, it could not, it, it was not a bug before, but once we change our requirements, maybe we had to, uh, we had to modify our software. So these could be some of the uh, challenges uh, that we have to handle um, at a very faster rate when we move towards agile uh, software development and testing. So how do we solve that? One of the things uh, you know, for uh, committing your software, there are software uh, control management, uh, uh, version control management applications that are available. Uh, again, these are only some of the examples you might be using 
a different uh, version control tools where you have a central uh, server and you can make a local copy of your software you can make the changes in your software okay and you can commit back the software or uh, you know uh, you have made some changes and you commit the software and uh, you understood that it broke something else you can revert back the changes so one of the solutions for uh, you know continuous integration uh, is using some kind of a version control tool okay it could be anything it could be any version control tool which supports branching uh, committing pulling and undoing the changes this could be one one uh, solution second thing is that you can, you have a workflow for continuous integration uh, where you have a ci server you can see there is a ci server here and there are developers who are working so they are pulling the software from this integration server they are making the changes okay and uh, they are committing the software into some source code like uh, a version control tool they are continuously committing and this version control tool has bidirectional communication with this continuous integration server continuous integration server has an automation where it will be uh, doing the steps that it is being asked for for example in this case it will build the software and uh, it will test the software and if uh, it breaks something the testing breaks something there will be a mechanism it could be like sending a mails to the people who have committed the software or revert backing to the older version of the software whatever we instruct the continuous integration server so this is the continuous integration workflow a very basic workflow it could be more complicated where you can have multiple uh, uh, continuous integration servers running but this is the bare minimum basic example where you have the continuous integration server and the source code management working hand in hand so far i believe so far so good okay and uh, I, and for the ci uh, continuous integration also there uh, there are multiple solutions you have the docker container is one of the example we took uh, where you can have the complete uh, continuous integration setup um, as a lightweight virtual machine and you can have multiple virtual machines running the build and testing continuously so this can run in parallel and uh, this will even speed up your software development and testing okay so you can have dockers is one of the uh, one of the solutions um, or you can have one single server as well the, uh, like we discussed in the previous slide and these dockers will have something called as docker file which will uh, have the instructions like uh, it's a simple file um, my, you know human readable file which will give you the steps for creating what kind of environment you want to have on that particular docker next thing okay these are all one of uh, some of the uh, ways we can uh, uh, we can quickly move to the agile but you know there still remain some challenges uh, what are the challenges are like uh, knowledge limitations we need to maybe we need to have uh, to upgrade our knowledge um, in order to move towards the agile uh, software testing maybe it takes time maybe we don't have time so timing constraints could be one of the things maybe we have already uh, in the fag end of uh, that project and maybe adapting uh, I, to the agile uh, uh, agile uh, uh, development could be a challenge because we don't have time cost could be another uh, another uh, constraint maybe it is more costly to move and uh, yes agile frameworks can become very complex uh, moving with time definitely there is a leverage there is a return over investment if you move towards agile but the 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 systems may tend to become complex over time so to uh, to sum it all up uh, so of uh, the previous slides about devops and ci cd so we have uh, benefits as well as we have some challenges one of the key benefits is that uh, you can very easily work uh, in the cross functional teams because you have a procedure defined how to 
work on any software. So you have a procedure. So it increases, it uh, actually, uh, the communication gaps are much reduced when it, uh, that is one of the benefits. Second thing is that there, you can leverage on your work done, okay? So this will, uh, uh, ha this will impact in lesser time to market. Uh, and uh, you will have the rapid feedback. The moment you commit your software to any software server, you know, tests may uh, get executed and you may then and there know that, uh, you know, what changes you made. So we remember what changes we made today, but we may not remember what changes we made into the software maybe six months down the line. So it becomes easy for you to fix the problem. Next thing is that uh, it is automated, so less manual work is done. So it is easily maintainable. So if it is more manual, it is more prone for errors. So the more the automation, it is, it is easily maintainable. Second thing is that uh, we have a streamlined development process. Everybody has to follow that. Now what are the challenges? Uh, it is a cultural change. So it is a mindset change. We have to uh, deal with that. Um, and uh, we need, maybe we need to upskill and have uh, uh, you know, new people who can help us move in that direction. Second thing is that tools, uh, cost of the tools, and uh, you, scalability is another challenge. Maybe uh, in some cases it could be a challenge. Scalability could be a challenge, and uh, you have to comply to some kind of a, a standard there. So this, these are some of the challenges when we move towards uh, the DevOps adoption. Okay, so we spoke at length about CI, CD, and uh, uh, Agile in the previous slides. So what we have to offer from the vector. So in the vector, we have uh, the CI, CD licensing model. So these are the uh, licenses that can be executed from the command line. Okay, they don't have the GUI support. And you can parallelize your testing. So this is one of the solutions we have. And also the Vectorcast has a CBT technology, chain-based testing technology, which we will be explaining at length in the coming uh, sessions, where only the test cases that get impacted by the source code change will be re-executed, thus saving your time. So if you have thousands of test cases, you made some software change, and you are not sure whether that software change has uh, you know, has not impacted your uh, quality of your software, then we have a CBT technology. More on that uh, in, the, in the next sessions. So that is one thing. And then we have, Vectorcast has an integration capability. It can integrate with multiple tools like, uh, uh, you know, be it JAMA, or if you don't use any requirement-based tools, we also provide uh, integration with Excel also. CSV also, integration is available in Vectorcast. And uh, we are happy that all our uh, Vectorcast features are uh, having command line capability. So Vectorcast is 100% automatable. So you have very good command line interface uh, with Vectorcast. So these are the, some of the salient features uh, that would help you move towards uh, the agile uh, development and testing, uh, uh, more importantly on the testing aspect, we have to offer. So we saw the same slide, just three slides, yeah. Yeah? yeah? Right? Right. Okay, we have we have integrations with JAMA, Polarian, CSV, Doors, Doors Next Generation. Yes, this is not a this is not a limited list. Okay. Maybe if you have a special requirement tool that I'm I have not spoken about, maybe we can take that and one on one discussion, and we can also support you if you have any requirement tool that I have not spoken about. We can also support you on that. So why I ask this question is in our organization they use a specific requirement management tool. So will it be possible? No, at Vector we, we, are, we are working, our orientation is always from the customers. 
we don't uh, really tell that to use any particular requirement tool. So we try to adapt to your requirements, whatever you okay. provide. Okay, okay, thank you. Understood. Okay, right. okay coming back. Uh, so if you remember three slides before, we saw the same uh, same uh, workflow. So in the workflow, what is the change is that after the building, we can automate the testing, and VectorCast will give you. Uh, you know, the, the continuous integration system will trigger VectorCast. VectorCast can in turn run your test cases and it can actually check in all the results, not all the results, the coverage and the, te and the testing pass-fail results back to your continuous integration server. For example, if you see the Jenkins website, we, VectorCast already has plugins um, for, uh, for creating a Jenkins job and uh, running the Jenkins job and getting back the results into the Jenkins. So we have integration with uh, Jenkins. And if you are not using uh, that CI tool, if you are using any other CI tool, no problem. We, our tool has 100% command line utility. So we can even uh, provide you support even in that case. This is just a basic example. Uh, this is the same where we are having the continuous integration server. And uh, the moment we check in the source code into the version control tool, the version control tool, uh, the continuous integration server will be in turn polling the version control tool. Uh, the moment it sees the changes, it will trigger the, uh, the build, the build, after the build, the testing and getting back the results. So this, in this way, we, VectorCast will uh, help you in your uh, CI, uh, continuous integration endeavor. Next thing is that uh, the previous example is where you have a single continuous integration server. If you want to have it parallelly, we also have solution for that. We have CI licenses where you can parallelize your testing and you can even save time. So this particular screenshot that you are seeing here where you trigger a job and the jobs are being uh, you know, distributed across multiple nodes and the multiple nodes will be running those uh, tests. And uh, you here, of course, we will be providing the licenses, but you should also have the compiler licenses in order to uh, parallelize here. Okay. Okay. So the the we, we next uh, next uh, activity is a demo. In this demo, we will try to mimic uh, this particular workflow. We have some source code. We will be committing that source code to the source code version control tool. And for the continuous integration, we took the Jenkins here. The Jenkins will be polling the continuous integration server and it will trigger the build. So we want to show this as part of our demo. So my colleague Harish will be uh, presenting the demo. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. You can raise your hand if you have any questions so that we can get to you. You can take the mic, yeah. So we are uploading the artifacts. Any, uh, uh, anything we need to follow, like uh, file versions or uh, uh, file format, something like that we need to follow or anything is fine? Uh, that totally depends upon your ecosystem. Okay. So for example, if you are using whatever we are speaking here, the, um, uh, what you, you made, a, you made some changes, right? Mm -hmm. You have committed your code. Now this continuous integration server, for example, Jenkins, it has plugins for multiple version control tools. Okay. And you can uh, trigger the polling mechanism for every minute, every hour, every day. You can actually schedule your build. So what it will do is that, uh, for example, if you take this basic example, if you say that the continuous integration server should poll every five minutes. So it will be polling and this version control tool, whatever the version control tool will have, it will have the mechanism to, uh, to show the difference of code, what you have committed now and the previously committed code. That will in turn trigger the build, your source code build. And then after the build, the logical step is you, you might have spent some time in, in having the test cases, right? So the test cases need to be executed. And uh, the pass-fail, uh, what is the next step? It could be different. It could be like sending mails to the people who have committed the code that something is broken. 
the advantage here is that you are you are able to solve the bug then and there you know that you know you made a change you know what change you made and then you are solving that problem now how vector cache can help you the vector cache can help you in running the test cases and the getting back the results with the cbt technology the change based testing technology where if you have thousands of test cases if i make only one line source code change there is no point in running all the test cases right we are wasting our resources that's where the cbt technology will come into picture vector cache will know uh, what uh, what change means which test cases got impacted by that particular source code change and it will give you the incremental testing report as well so that is the that is where vector cache will help you. apart from that we also have the licensing mechanism that will aid you in in taking the maximum benefits out of this ci cd mechanism like i spoke about the command line ci cd licensing mechanism where you can paralyze your job so next is the demo there is another question yeah yeah can you raise your hand okay yeah okay ha yeah i have a question uh, when you are talking of the tests that will be run after the build process you are essentially referring to regression tests right because uh, the the tests related to this feature wouldn't have been built by that time especially in a mission critical kind of a system so you are just talking of the tests uh, the regression tests that are impacted right yes or or do you suggest tdd kind of a approach uh, for uh, these kind of uh, systems where uh, you know you can in, uh, involve uh, cbt into that see test driven development is where you we will have the test cases from the test cases we'll write the software yeah. right vector cast even supports that mm -hmm. so uh, to reiterate that we never uh, it, it totally depends upon our customers so if you want to take the tdd path even in that case we have the mechanism to to have the test cases of course the test cases will fail when you don't have any software but once you start developing the software it will make sense mm -hmm. coming to the regression testing yes sir you are spot on this mechanism will help you uh, to uh, get maximum output of your re regression testing and to leverage on the time spent on the development of these test cases okay so there are ad other features in vector cast uh, where the test cases are independent of your uh, uh, environments vector cast environments where if you change uh, uh, you know the source code uh, let us say you are only refactoring the source code the test cases are still valid you can import the test cases across multiple versions of your software and 100% you have to come up with new test cases when you implement new feature there is no there is no uh, uh, second opinion on that but uh, i see a challenge here that you are already integrating something new into your source code without that piece of functionality being tested so how how that is being it uh, is not only you see whenever we are modifying any source code it is not only that we are implementing a newer feature it could be that we came up with a better logic for the feature that is already available so we okay. may be refactoring our software okay. so what happens usually is that when we refactor our software means as a dev uh, means uh, as a so embedded developer previously even i was little hesitant to change my software because uh, you know i it is already working if i implement a better better logic in there uh, shorter code will it impact my you know the main requirement so that's where vector cache will help you it will help you to test early mm -hmm. to test often mm -hmm. so this is the main uh, funda here, fundamental thing here so the moment you write something you should be in a position to test it early and you have to be you have to have the bandwidth to test it often mm -hmm. so that is where we have the vector cache providing uh, the cbt technology change based testing technology and also parallelizing Mm -hmm. we are parallelly running so that is where we help you and up. but what about a new feature if it is a new feature we have to write new test cases sir based on the requirement so before it is integrated means uh, once a source control server triggers the or uh, the continuous integration then only you see if you have not modified your source code mm -hmm. let us say you have mod not modified your source code and you have you have written new test cases i am mm -hmm. taking another example Mm -hmm. then also vector cache will help you run only those subset of test cases it will not run all the test cases even in that case so if you have developed a new feature 
based on the requirements, you have to develop the test cases. Of course, we have the mechanism to automate the test case in the unit testing. We provide you the complete, uh, uh, you know, the GUI automation where it is just point and click for you. Mm. But still, that even that clicking you have to do, the generation of that particular test case, you have to still do it. Newer test case, you have to add. But you will get the leverage over the period of time because you are writing more test cases. So this will become an asset moving forward. So in Vectorcast, you are not throwing away all the test cases. You can reuse the test cases. Okay. This is one of the advantage. But yes, you have to write new test cases for new features. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. <coughs> he is there. So I will we'll get back to you. Uh, sir, I have two questions. So uh, does Vectorcast provide plugins uh, to integrate with non-vector uh, software tools, for example, Coverage Master from Gaio. Okay, it depends upon uh, your requirement. It is something we cannot answer here. Maybe you have to write to us and uh, specify the exact reason and maybe we will help you in, the, in that the direction. The vector, uh, vector can, pr based on the request, Vector can provide the plugins for integration of such tools, then also it's okay. See, the tool is very flexible. As an engineer, I can tell you that the tool has many uh, open open ends. I mean, I'm sorry to use the open end, but tool has many uh, ways to integrate with other tools. Okay, but whether we can integrate with your tool, it is totally driven by your requirement and our mutual, uh, you know, understanding of the requirement. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my second question is with respect to the continuous integration. Uh -huh. Assuming that I have uh, multiple test environments, mm -hmm. but the source code has to be fetched from single repository. Mm -hmm. So using Vectorcast, can I initiate, uh, as part of continuous integration, uh, through automation, can I initiate testing on multiple test environments parallelly? 100%. We have the, we have, we, Vectorcast supports, uh, you know, base directory modeling as well. So you can have the same source code in the multiple environments and you can still run the test cases parallelly, even in that. Because case. in our organization, we use Hills environment for carrying out the system testing. There are multiple Hills environment. So uh, when the code gets released, right, we initiate the testing. Currently, it's manual. Mm. So if, if Vectorcast can be used to initiate the testing in all the Hills environment parallelly at once, once the code gets uh, See, we checked. have the mechanism, but you Does have to understand that you the licensing also comes into picture. So when you want to do it parallelly, it means that you should have the compiler. So Vectorcast is a software testing tool. So we don't have, uh, we don't provide any licenses for compilers or debuggers. So you have to plan that. No, no, no. we have the specific compilers. For example, uh, Kanu or Vita Studio have specific compilers. It's only that does Vectorcast support initiating that uh, uh, starting of a testing on multiple. We have, we have the mechanism to do that. Okay, thank you. Yes. And also you uh, you had a specific query, right? So just an input for you. Uh, on each table, we have kept contact forms. So I would request anyone who has any specific query, you can just fill out the contact form so that anyone, one of our technical experts will get in touch with you so that we can discuss further on that. Okay, sure. sure. Thank you. Yeah. So you had some questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sir, can we understand this vector cached as a test case management tool? where, you know, we manage, it's maintain a test, the test case. Uh, test automation tool. Okay. You can, see, if you, if you parallel, if you think of manual testing, you have so many challenges there. So all these challenges are addressed by this tool. And here, I mean, we have uh, uh, other presentations where you will have much more hands-on on how Vectorcast works. But, uh, but this is, uh, like we said, we, uh, we have declared one problem statement and slowly we are getting into how to solve the, those problems. Okay. So one of the most happening thing in software development is continuous integration. And in continuous integration also, you can seamlessly use Vectorcast. For example, you can be a new user or you can be an existing user of Vectorcast. But you can seamlessly, if you change your testing, de development and testing paradigm to agile methodology, we will support our customers seamlessly and we have these things to offer. So that's what it is. Uh, okay, like uh, let's say uh, there are 1000 test cases in a project and uh, let's say like we have 10 to 11 features and you are just thousand fixing… 1000 test cases and… Uh, 10 to 11 features. 10 to 11 features, features requirements uh, let us uh, say. Requirements, uh, okay. yeah. So you are changing a one line of 
code fix. Maybe it might be a bug or something. Mm -hmm. So running all the test cases, uh, it might take some time, right? Uh, because uh, that bug is related to only one specific uh, requirement, but not all. Mm -hmm. So is there a, you know, uh, running on, uh, the test cases only specific to that uh, feature or are we going to run all the test cases available? Okay. Since VectorCast is a software testing tool, so you make any software code change. We have a technology called as change-based testing, CBT. That's what I was referring to a couple of minutes earlier, change-based testing. So the change-based testing technology will, will know what are the test cases that got impacted by the source code change and only those subset of test cases will be re-executed. So you will save time there, yes? 100% okay. we have that feature. Okay, okay. And one last question, like when you say parallel execution, can we consider uh, you are using some microservices type or some? It is all totally dependent on your requirement. So, so at Vector, we are very flexible. Okay. Okay. So we will adapt to your workflow. That's what I'm saying. Okay. This is only one example. <laughs> this is not the only example. We will adapt to your ecosystem. How you want Vector, vector to work, VectorCast to work, we will adapt to that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, Hi. Hi. Uh, um, actually, I am using the Docker and container. So, uh -huh. so till now, I am able to execute like sequentially. So, huh? are you? I am able to execute sequentially, not the parallel execution. Mm -hmm. So, are you saying that the all the containers you will launch and at the end you will sum up all the result and submit to the Power Force or Gate or whatever? Okay, so Docker means, uh, I mean, if you want us to... Uh, see, see, I'm launching a single container, and there is project is created, and all tests are executing sequentially. Hmm. So they are taking a lot of time. So as what I have seen, that as per that parallel execution, like you will launch all the containers and some of the result or how it will be, uh, I'm confused okay, with that. We, we have even uh, something worked on that. Okay. okay even for that, we, maybe we can... Uh, talk to you offline. Sure. So even even parallelize that. Test case execution can also be parallelized, <coughs> even in that case. Okay. So we have licensing models even that support that as well. Okay. And next one is uh, that all the reports are generated. So those reports are keeping with the Jenkins or whatever the CI we are using or we are able to submit to the Git or, or any configuration management tool. Again, huh. this is only not the only way. So okay. we have Python APIs mm -hmm. where you can capture the raw data from the test case executions or, you know, all the different things, whatever you want. So, and you can use it in the next level. So let us say that after running the test cases, you want to use this data in a some, some other different tool, your mm -hmm. proprietary tool. So we have, that's what I'm saying, we are 100% command line utilities are there. We have Python APIs that will capture different parameters that you may you may need. For example, you want to capture the test cases that were not at all executed since the okay. previous build. So we can come up with a Python automation provided to you. When you run that Python script, it will list the test cases that were never executed. So like that, we, we can provide you different, uh, base. it's all driven by your requirement. We will work on it and we will provide you the solution. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, since Winter mainly concentrates on the test strategies, uh, in case of a deficiency of test cases, like for I have a requirement, and when I have to check for the MCDC completeness, uh, will it identify any of the deficiency of the test cases there? Okay, MCDC by itself is a metric. Okay, and MCDC, uh, uh, like when I say metric, it is a mandate that you have to test it. Okay, and MCDC doesn't uh, 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 effectively say that you know there is no bug in the software. Okay. So VectorCast will, is aligned with MCDC kind of a test case generation based on the Boolean expression, whatever you have in that particular condition. VectorCast is intelligent enough to give you the tables. It does the analysis and it will give you the tables and it will give you the values that will actually uh, force the control to go into that particular uh, logic so that you can get MCDC coverage. But you know, it will, it, uh, as a testing tool, 
we don't provide any deficiencies in the MCDC because MCDC by itself has deficiencies. It is just a metric so stating that, you know, if you do if as per your stringency level, this has to be done. But by doing MCDC, um, is my 100%, my software has no uh, bugs. Maybe based on your requirement, it may not have bug. But there could be some logical bug. But you may not need it. Based on your requirement, you may not need it to be tested. So that's what it is. Yeah, I have one question on the vector cast. Like, will it come with a qualification kit or how it is? This whole environment, whatever you said for Devo 330, if, if we need to go Sir, for it, or is it traditional? Because we are moving in a different direction now. Okay. Uh, qualification kit and all, my colleague Harikishan will help you on that. We have we have consultancy services. Okay. We have that. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, I just want to know the variance. Like uh, you had mentioned vector cast near the development. So does it cater uh, unit testing, UI automation? We have two flavors, madam. We will be discussing that in the later sessions. Okay. Does we it support desktop application automation as well? Uh, not directly, but hmm. we can work out on it. We are, we are complementing to support, uh. support the desktop application. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. The CBT that you were talking about, uh, do we need to feed the test cases uh, to track our line of change? And do we need to manually uh, send, uh, maybe let there are test cases, uh, 10 test cases which are getting affected by this one line? Do we need to do this manually or is it automatic in nature? 100% automation. Okay. 100% automation. In the, like we have two flavors of uh, VectorCast. One is the VectorCast CC++, one is VectorCast QA. <laughs> and the, and the VectorCast CC++ is our uh, managed tool. It's a unit testing tool where the scope is at the function level, okay? okay? And uh, for the uh, for the other tool, it is scope is at the file level because you are doing system testing there. Okay. Okay. Maybe so you will track the line coverage. Yeah, yeah, everything. Uh, we, we cannot tell you how we do that, <laughs> yeah. but uh, we, you will have the change <laughs> impact report and uh, what test cases got impacted. Sure. Yeah, thanks. We need to show the qualification because how, how CBT is effective, uh, certification authorities look for that. Yes, that's what I'm saying, sir. We can provide you that information, but uh, it depends upon what kind of uh, uh, stringency level you are following. And uh, we have done the qualifications before also. I mean, the, after the CBT got introduced into product, uh, we have done qualifications also. Unfortunately, I'm not the expert in that. Okay, okay, fine. okay? Uh, we can come back to you on that. Yeah, we maybe the we will. Uh, in vector cast tool, first time we may write the hundred test cases. Okay, next time uh, we requirement changes only in the two test cases that we uploading into the management uh, source file. Mm. So only the two test cases is it possible to run in the continuous integration? That's what it will do. If you make changes in the two test cases and you did not make any change in the source code, mm -hmm. okay, so only two test cases will be executed in the CBT. Yes. <coughs> yes. Your mic, can you say hello? Hello. When you try to integrate any requirement tool and try to remove some requirements, but the cast can pop up a message saying that these requirements are no longer there. And the test cases that are linked to these requirements are getting impacted. So we will give you information. Actioning you have to do. So it, it will fail or it will be giving out the notification? That's what. We will give you the information mm -hmm. whether you want to keep those test cases or whether you want to remove them. If the test cases are failing, whether you want to make them, you know, make them to pass, action you have to take. Message we will provide you. Thank you. Yeah. Session part of it now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so the continuous integration, continuous deployment or uh, uh, development, that is CI, CD and the continuous testing, CI, CT, that's what we uh, having with the VectorCast. Uh, we use uh, Jenkins as a demonstration tool. Of course, we uh, have an integration with uh, other tools as well, like Bamboo or some, some other uh, customized to, uh, tools also. Uh, I have an example of a Jenkins, so we'll discuss more on that. So first, you have to have a, a Jenkins installed and any subversion, like uh, if you're using with any source code management tool like a subversion or a GitHub or anything like that. So I have a SVN in my machine, so we'll discuss more on the, the SVN part. Yeah. 
So we have installed the, uh, uh, the Jenkins and the SVN is in place and we are uh, committing our software into the, uh, the SVN part. So how do we create a job? How do we uh, uh, make an execution, the test execution? Before that, we have to have a vector cast manage environment ready. Uh, we have worked on your uh, project. We have requirements, uh, the test cases you wrote, thousands of test cases you wrote, and you want to make it a, a continuous execution. Yeah, so that's where uh, we'll create a project outside and we'll feed, or rather, we create a job in the Jenkins and we'll uh, we'll tell Jenkins where the uh, where to run the uh, the test cases. Yeah, so th this is the uh, the Jenkins uh, uh, homepage. Yeah, so that's the the manage Jenkins where you uh, have a, a vector cast plugin. So that's where you uh, just get the the manage plugin. You just type in the vector cast uh, uh, coverage. So that's where you will get the the vector cast uh, uh, plugin available. So I already have that uh, plugin available here. So this is where the vector cast plugin comes in. Uh, once you click on that, you create a job. The what type of job you would like to create? Uh, uh, would you like to have a single job or a pipeline job? I think this is one of the question I had earlier. So I have created a single job for our uh, demonstration. So, uh, so these are the different uh, jobs I have created. Yeah. So I have a, a Jenkins uh, Vika single, and for the SVN, that's the uh, the project I have created. So you create a a, a job, and uh, you need to configure that first before you start executing your uh, test cases outside. Okay. Yeah. So that's the that's the environment uh, I have created in my local machine. This is where my dot PCM project uh, runs. Yeah. So we are only working with the Vectorcast manage uh, uh, license, enterprise license with uh, with Jenkins, and we are uh, telling Jenkins where the the sub version available. So I have it in this particular uh, setup. Uh, we just provide the repository of the uh, the U URL, and that's that's where all my source code is located. Once you are making any commits, it will be done in this particular path. Yeah. And uh, we'll trigger, we'll start triggering the job as and when the when there is a commit happens to the the source code. So this is this is the uh, this is the way it works, right? Uh, the, the the developer sits on some other location and the tester is in a different location and they uh, commit the, their source code. And uh, tester on the other hand, so they will have their uh, test cases ready. They would like to run it, so they'll just link it with that path whatever I mentioned. Uh, and once the source code change happens, the, your test case will start executing your uh, 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 continuously as and when the make make uh, as and when there is any change in the source code, it kicks off the job. Yeah, so that's uh, that's a trigger button we have to uh, uh, click on to uh, start the the uh, the test execution. And these are the plugins. Uh, the, the plugins has its uh, vector cast commands already. So these are the automatically created uh, uh, commands within the Jenkins job. So you don't have to you know uh, write your own uh, commands as such. So once it's done, this is for again, this is for a Windows uh, uh, build commands I'm working with, and we are also having the Unix uh, build commands. Yeah, and once we are done with that, you just need to save this. Once the saving is done, you go back to that uh, uh, the main page and you build it. So these are different options. Was uh, what I was talking about. When you want to build the the uh, the job now, you just simply click on this build button. The the job will start right away. So now if you are depending on some uh, the commit to happen. So we'll wait for that to trigger to happen outside, and then we'll uh, the the job will uh, kick off by itself. Now, how I had done it that was, uh, so we have made some changes here, and we have checked in in this particular uh, in this uh, uh, path. That's where I was uh, showing, and in the in the source code, I'll make some changes, and I'll make some changes here, and I'll commit that uh, source code. There are two ways of committing that I have. Uh, I'm making use of uh, the command line rather than the, uh, the the GUI part. Of course, you can right click and uh, uh, commit that change here like that. SVN commit. This is where you provide your revision version. I think there was a question on what's the version I will I decide that. So there was uh, in this particular version you can actually provide what version you would like to commit. So that's the the message basically. So you can add that in the the commit message. So I have taken a, the uh, the, uh, the automation part of it where I'm just using that commit.bat. That's the, the bash script I'm running in the background where I'll commit that particular file with uh, with some message and will uh, trigger the job. So I'll just uh, uh, run this uh, commit file now. And 
So that's the, the commit happened, and in the job, uh, it will start. Yeah, so that's how it uh, starts off with the, the, uh, the running the single job. Yeah, so we have, we can, uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is what I'm doing it uh, as a demonstration. Now you can imagine there is a developer makes changes and you have your uh, thousands of test cases running here and you're waiting for uh, the commit, source code uh, commit to happen. Yeah, so once the commit happens, your, uh, the test case will start running automatically. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's the, uh, this is a job running and if you, if you can get to know about your uh, how the progress is going in the, the console. Yeah, that's how the, the progress is going with uh, the environment. What's the environment? What is the, uh, what are the test cases it's creating? What are the, the, the reports it generated? And everything will be captured there and you'll finally you'll get a, a the success or a unstable result depending on what uh, status of your project is. Now, now, how do I get the results, right, uh, in the, in the, uh, in build we have uh, in the 55th that's the job uh, I'm working on and this is where uh, it will get the complete uh, the code coverage and if you have all the uh, the reports if you have any aggregate report uh, you can get to know more about uh, how the uh, the code coverage uh, looks like and we uh, we also have something like a change based testing as my colleagues uh, spoken about if there is any change happening in your source code and uh, it, if it affects, say, one out of 100 test cases, then it will execute that test case alone. So you don't have to spend too much time in executing those uh, redundant 99 test cases because it, it costs you a lot of time. Yeah. So to avoid that, uh, there's a chain-based testing. When you integrate with uh, the Jenkins, it will execute one test case out of uh, 100 test cases and get you the latest result. So this is what's happening at the moment. I have total 38 uh, test cases in this particular environment and out of which uh, one test case affected and 37 are unaffected, yeah? So this is on the total bench what I'm talking about. Uh, to be more precise on uh, the Jenkins related things, I've made changes in, in this particular uh, environment where uh, one of the file has been changed and committed. So that's where uh, the job triggered automatically and uh, it, it gets the, the, uh, the results like that. So uh, the rebuild status says the incremental build succeeded. And for the other environment, for example, it's, uh, it's not the only environment we are creating. We, we might have uh, more than one environment within that particular project. So it will not disturb the other environments. It will only look for the environment which made the changes for. So it will execute only those uh, uh, test cases against those environments. So, so these are the different uh, uh, test cases executed, and uh, these are the different metrics you'll get out of that. And uh, so, yeah, so this, this is the, the, the group, and these are the different environments, what I have here, and total number of test cases, and uh, what are the uh, statement coverage, branch coverage, and MCDC. All the reports will be uh, shown in the, the Jenkins job, yeah? Um, so that's about uh, uh, the Jenkins and its uh, demonstration. Uh, so if you have any questions, yeah, uh, we can take it, yeah. Yeah, there's one question. Uh, hi. Hi. If you had any statements or any other functions in the middle of the code, you changed only the uh, value, isn't it, in the demo? Yeah. So if you change any, if you add any function, huh? calling function, if you call some functions or the add, uh, extra statements, like will it add the uh, extra new test cases to you? It will not add the test case, like my colleague said. It will not add the test case, uh, but of course you can make that change in, in the home environment. You can, of course, add the, uh, the automation test case. It will only tell uh, what part of the test case, uh, what changes you made and what are the test cases affected by the source code change. It might fail, it might pass. It all depends on how your code logic is. But it will not introduce uh, new test cases Check. for the change Check. source code. You have to do it manually. So we need to do it manually. Manually we need so to do it. Uh, yes. I had one question. Um, during this execution, right, the license of vector cast, is it locked throughout the <coughs> execution of the test or only during the start and the end? Uh, it will be execu it will lock for the execution time. entire execution execution yes even on the target when it is executing yes okay can you elaborate more on your questions i want to know more about the license uh, basically when it is executing in the target vector cast is actually not doing anything so why should it um, lock the license it will execute it will flash it will flash that uh, flashing is something which debugger is doing right mm -hmm. 
so you are and executing the, the test cases yeah, and debugger is doing and the target is basically executing and probably populating the data out in but some but you are still looking for the data some. coming out of the uh, target and display on the code coverage viewer so that still uh, a job so is needed so is it something which is dynamic it, it doesn't happen dynamically right it happens post execution of the target execution of the dot out or mm -hmm. so i was just curious to know whether it's complete cycle or it's only during the starting and ending See, well, i think uh, we can i will explain you that uh, so uh, why you was curious because you are locking for the entire duration of the execution right mm -hmm. so which is loss of precious time of uh, license okay uh, sirimas you have any comments right uh, so vector cast uh, license will be something like uh, when it needs uh, the license, uh -huh. it will quickly, for example, you are saying that uh, you want to execute it on the target. Mm -hmm. So there is our licensing works in, that in, in a way that we will uh, know that you are trying to run it on the target mm -hmm. and that particular license will be checked in. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, the, there is one base license. So there is one base license and on top of it, all the features, okay. different features will have different licenses. Mm -hmm. So the base uh, feature license will be always engaged because you have open, you're opening that environment and then you're running one test case. Mm -hmm. So the base mm -hmm. license will always be there, but this, uh, the license that is specific to running okay. on one particular target will be checked in and checked out continuously. So if you stop, it will be checked out. So that somebody else can use okay. it. But the moment you open vector cache, there will be one license uh, which will be consumed. Okay. That's how it works. Hi. Uh, when this, yes. uh, this auto trigger of that build process, when there are co new code commits, can we control different like uh, variables? Like not every, even in particular file is committed, but uh, when baseline happens, are many other variables maybe we can add that in like when to trigger this continuous integration when we do baseline not 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 for every change of the code so yeah we can do that uh, depending on how you are uh, planned it for my demonstration i've just created a, a, a small example okay. uh, i've just made some changes to the the source code and just making it to trigger whenever the change happens of course there are some ways to do it i have not uh, prepared for that uh, demonstration but it can be customized can be done yeah so you can override cbt okay uh, there is no hard and fast rule that you have to use cbt so let us say that you have made changes and you want to rerun all the test cases even you can override that yes. uh, hi yes. harish yes so my question is so the, we are talking about the unit testing here right yes so what about the system testing so that uh, i have to do it manually again so select the test cases and everything uh, what all should be executed? No. Uh, so uh, the 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 cover pro the, the tool maybe you will be using was uh, the older one where the vector cast cover. The vector cast QA is the latest uh, uh, flavor of uh, you know system testing where the things can be done automatically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you just make some changes to the source code. Your system test case will trigger. Yeah. Okay. So that's automatically can be done. Okay. Thank you. It will be covered. Yeah, uh, just now I, um, I've asked about the CBT part. Yes. Right? So one thing is like, for example, a particular test case runs uh, in a specific way for a specific configuration. Okay. When I say configuration, it could be some uh, uh, if defines or it could be some parameters which are controlling the test yes. flow. Yes. Right. Uh, now, when you're defining a particular line of change is actually executing only one test case. And uh, if I want to modify the behavior of the test case by modifying this configuration parameter or mm -hmm. basically anything. So how will the vector cache know that some other tests are also getting affected because the change of configuration has now started kicking in? Okay, so internally it, uh, it is an internal uh, methodology how it uh, tests with. So we have a X version of your so uh, software already in, in the local repository. Uh, in the in the environment folder, and once you're hash defining, you're adding or deleting it. You it's, it'll be compared against, and what changes you are making into the new version of the software, and it makes a calculation or analyze what are the test cases have got affected by the change what you made. Any small change you are making, it's an affected uh, uh, test cases, right? So you're either you're hash defining one macro or you're removing it. It doesn't matter. It just make a comparison with your older uh, version of the software with a newer version. So that's how it uh, it analyzes and uh, uh, run those uh, you know delta test cases. Okay. 
it will not spend time in executing all of those uh, full test cases. Okay. Uh, that means it's, it's analyzing your entire database in one way, right? For example, let's compare it with some Linux. Uh, uh, it's a pretty big, like uh, you have some GBs of uh, uh, code uh, yes. written, millions of lines of code. Yes. So one line of change for a configuration of a specific Linux distribution. Mm -hmm. So will it actually have to analyze the entire Linux distribution again and maintain some, uh, and how much time does it take to do that actually? We are talking about a small .c file or .cpp file. Yeah, yeah. That's where how your comparison is made. Are okay. you saying there are millions of code in one .c file? Uh, so yeah, maybe f one .c file might affect some thousands of test cases uh, based on the configuration that I yes, mentioned. Yes. Like now, in order to get to that point where it understands, okay, now I am going to affect, uh, this particular line is going to affect thousands of test yes. cases instead of one test case. Yes. It has to analyze this entire database, right? Uh, do you have any metrics to say how much time does it ve a vector cache take to come to that point where uh, um, it analyzes and makes the changes? It will uh, will not give the time as such, how much time it takes. It just gives the data or other the test cases, what are the different test cases affected, and you can get to know what are those uh, test cases affected. Not exactly the time frame. Um, Sinos, do you have anything to See, add? See, VectorCast maintains a flat file. Yeah. So whatever the time you are saying is already consumed when you are building the environment. Okay, it has a flat file and it knows uh, what are the variables, uh, what are the functions, what are those signatures, what are the functions, dep dependencies, everything it will maintain in a database management system. We have XML based DBMS. Okay. Now let us say that there is a global variable and you made a change in the global variable and this global variable is, is used across multiple C files. Then 100% more test cases need to be re-executed. But this analysis is done when you are building your environment itself. So your, your time means VectorCast maintains that database. That's how it knows that you made a change and it does a diff. And, the, and it knows that which test cases are covering which lines of code. Based on that, it will know that uh, these test cases got impacted. Yeah, thanks, sir. Yeah. Hi, Arish. Uh, I have two questions. The first question is like uh, this unit testing will run on the simulation or on the actual target? Okay, this is a, a different topic what we are discussing. Uh, to answer shortly, yes, we can uh, run the test cases both on the simulation method and on the target. Okay. And second question, like we have the statement coverage, branch coverage and yes. all, right? Like we have the multiple releases. In the first release, we will be go for 100% statement coverage and second release will go for the 100% branch coverage. So do we have option to set up that, uh, like if we are not covering 100% statement, uh, the, the Jenkins will trigger red? Jenkins will that? trigger the job. It all depends on how your test cases are designed, how you uh, designed your uh, managed yeah. project. So yeah. our test case is not covering 100%, yeah. so is this tool will report red? The tool will report uh, if you are having the deficiency in the statement in first build, it will tell you that this is a percentage of uh, uh, coverage need to be done. It will not tell what, what is the branch coverage need to be done because you are not instrumented the, the environment for the branch coverage. Yeah, so we, we have to uh, make that instrumentation uh, for the second build and uh, automatically Jenkins will take care of uh, the execution. That can be done from the vector cache? Yes. Jenkins will just run your uh, job. It will not make any changes to your instrumentation level or anything like that. Okay. Of course, you can instrument, you can do it with uh, the commands what I shared. Um, will it demand some more time to analyze that? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi. hi. Uh, yes. Yes. Here, Harish. Okay. okay. Yes, Harish. Uh, suppose there is some source code changes. Yeah. And will the report, will the vector cast provide me a report? saying which and all the test case names that will be huh. impacted. Yeah, so it will not exactly give that report as a report uh, as such. So we can get to know what are those uh, test cases changed in the uh, the full report. When you exactly take out the, the full report, it gets you the time frame when the test cases are executed. Suppose there are hundreds of test cases you're having in your environment and out of which five test cases are being executed. The 95 test cases are redundant, they're not running. Uh, so it will uh, run the remaining five test cases and it will be a, a latest time frame what you get through and you can get to know. This is what I'm talking about, the unit testing project. When you're having a system testing project, you will get to know what, what test cases have been affected with the report also. You can something get like to know from the yeah, report. Something like the impact uh, analysis. Impact analysis report, yeah. That can be done in the system testing uh, tool. Okay, thank you. Hello. Yeah, here. Yes. 
So, regard, you already used Vectorcast. Yes. So, I want to know, uh, like, is there any minimum version where it supports this plugins and stuff? Uh, what version? Minimum version of Vectorcast to have a support of uh, Jenkins? Um, we are having the latest version in the... 16, uh, 2016. From 2016. 16 or later. Okay. Yeah. So, but CPT the latest, if you want to use this latest plugins, we, uh, we, we, we always suggest you to upgrade to the latest version. Why? Because we have made lot of changes on how we handle the, the data. I mean, the test case execution data from 2016 till now. So, uh, if, you are, if you are using the plugins, we always suggest you to go with the latest version. At and least uh, 21, at least. And the CBT comes to picture only if you use it along with the Jenkins plugin? No, no, no. It Not necessarily. No, 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 no. CBT is Vectorcast feature. This is only one of the ways you can use Vectorcast. CBT, you can use it without Jenkins also. Yeah. And if you want to run it with multi nodes, we can do it without Jenkins as well. That totally depends on you. You want to create uh, multiple uh, scripts and you want to run it parallelly on multiple things. You have to show, you ha that's what I'm saying. We are very flexible. You show us your workflow. And we'll try to see how we can adapt to your workflow. And whatever setup you have shown to just create the job and yes. the sample scripts, is that all by default available if you install the plugin or that's your script you wrote it? Uh, the, the commands, what I was showing here is... Uh, it's all automatic. It will it'll all be there automatically. Because uh, you have shown it pretty simple. You didn't show any configuration of where, where is your environment set up, what Sorry. is your project, all that, right? So everything is it taken Okay, so it, it's all there in the configuration. That's where, uh, uh, okay, maybe we'll, we'll create a, a sample one so that we'll have a more understanding of how, how the, um, uh, the things work. Uh, I'll create a single job, and you just need to provide the path where you are having the .vcm project. Yeah. Vectorcast manage project. Vectorcast manage project. Uh, we are just distribution Vectorcast manage only. It's not works with a unit test environment. Anyway, it's a, a Vectorcast manage project path you need to provide, including the dot .vcm. Yeah, and uh, you just provide the, these details if necessary. Uh, the retry the license file. Browse to that .vcm file uh, here. That .vcm file only you you just browse it, and maybe they can see that you know it is automatically created. So is this all in assumption that it's all going to be on the local system? Because your Jenkins is pointing to your local itself? Yes, this is a simple example, but it is just a bare minimum. You, ha you can have multi-node, you can have, uh, d uh, you know, server vectorcast running on one system and you are committing source code, server, and uh, vectorcast triggering the test cases. All those, uh, you know, migrated mode also is supported, you know and you want to have the local copy, what we are showing, that is also supported. So we want to make it as simple as possible because we want to get through the feature is available to the audience. It is all there. We can discuss it one-on-one -on -one if you raise a support case. So this is where the, the Windows command or uh, uh, the Unix command if you are working with, right? Uh, so it's currently empty, so you can uh, have your own uh, commands there. By default, Vectorcast and Jenkins, of course, they will have the, the set of uh, uh, the clackcast command to execute automatically if you on top of that if you would like to customize your own script you can do that Harish, I yes. have a question yes uh, as you were saying there are 100 test cases and yes. under cbt we have only five test cases which has been modified yes. but my re requirement would have impacted other test cases also right Will it that be identified or it will just execute the only if those five test cases? Okay, let's understand. So there is a requirement change and yes. I have to have the source code change according to that. Good. Yeah. If the source code change happens, Vectorcast will, will now know what are the te uh, test cases it's affecting the those source code change you made. Yeah, the it, it might affect five test cases or 50 test cases. It depending on what requirements changed or what, uh, what are the te test cases it's affecting. All Vectorcast is looking at is the source code change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when there is a source code change happens, the accordingly you have to have a so, uh, sorry. When there is a requirement change happens, you need to have a the source code change, right? So according to that, it will calculate and uh, execute those remaining test cases. It's not that I've changed the requirement and uh, there is no source code change. That's uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, is my it? My question was in case if the tester fails to identify which are the test cases which can get impacted. 
and I, I say that only this requirement, I have given only those five test cases modified. Mm -hmm. So under CBT, it tests only those five test cases, right? It will only, run, uh, it will only execute those five test cases affected by the, uh, the source code change, not with the requirement change. Okay. Requirement change, uh, it's that, that's not there. So we are looking at the source code change here. Uh, so, with respect to unit testing, does uh, Vectorcast automatically generate the test cases based on the source code? Yes. Again, it's off the topic to answer your uh, uh, to the question. Yes, we can do it with the automation uh, test case. We have something called a, a basis part test case, MCDC test case, partition test case. We can do it automatically. Because, uh, in one of the tools what we use currently, right, it generates the, we feed the code and it automatically generates the cases for C0, C1 and MCDC coverage. Yes. So does Vectorcast have that feature? We have a sophisticated versions of these uh, features now. We are in 2022 SP7. Uh, all the, the source code will be analyzed by the tool and it understands what are the different uh, path it, it's going through and it inserts accordingly those many number of test cases. Be it is a, a basis part test case for the statement coverage and if it's a MCDC, if you're having a safety critical application, if you're working with MCDC as the mandatory instrumentation level uh, requirement, then we can uh, insert the um, MCDC test case automatically. Okay, sir, thank you. Yeah. My second question is, yes. uh, uh, basically what I'm not able to completely understand is, yes. see, I have an environment, test environment, and I have Jenkins. Yes. So uh, with Jenkins available, right? Why? Because I, I feel that all my testing can be enabled using Jenkins. So why in addition Vectorcast is required? I'm not able to understand that. What additional thing that Vectorcast offers over Jenkins? Jenkins is not a testing tool. It is a, a triggering, just job triggering tool. That's what I'm just. Yes, yes, you're right. Yeah. It's a, a triggering tool, but yeah. along with Jenkins, it requires some amount of uh, scripting to enable my testing, mm -hmm. continuous integration testing. Yeah. Yeah. So which we generally do it in our current environment. So yes. I'm not able to understand what in, in addition to this, what uh, Vectorcast offers to me. Vectorcast you have. It is offering you automation. It is giving you the uh, change impact report as part of Jenkins. Yeah. That's, That's the only thing I can see now. That is change based testing, whatever. No, we're no. Discussing. Even the reports, we have not shown you that. Some of the reports and the, over the period of time, how your coverage is, uh, you know, faring, you know, that, uh, what to say, the profile of your coverage, all those things will be shown as part of your build, okay, when you are using Vectorcast plugins, okay. Now, let us say that you don't want to use Vectorcast plugins, but still want to use Jenkins. Then we have command line utilities. Yeah, we, can, we can provide that also, where you can just run that and you will uh, j just see, then also CBT will work. But this reporting, whatever he is showing, that uh, particular report as part of your Jenkins build, that may not be there. Okay. Okay, thanks. So, I have a question uh, regarding his first question, continuation of the continuation of that, like uh, you're telling vector Vectorcast will create the automatic test cases based on the source code, like is it based on source code or in the design? Because uh, we are following the process like ISO and uh, IEC, like where the test pack has to be done based on the design input. So that can be done via design? So the prime input is the source code, as we mentioned, this is the first uh, requirement for the uh, any test tool, Vectorcast for, uh, for that matter. Uh, we take the source code as an input and we build an environment uh, that we build the Vectorcast harness out of that. And we, then Vectorcast will analyze what are the dif distinct paths it's going through and understand how many test cases I need to insert and insert those many number of test cases automatically. It's all the, uh, depending on the source code, not with the uh, design. Not, if you not can with the design. Uh, okay. We can discuss more on your questions uh, to get more elaborated uh, you know, okay. input from you. Okay. Hello, I Adish. Yes, yes. Uh, just I would like to understand about the traceability matrix. Yeah. If we execute the, uh, this uh, statement branch coverage and additionally we have the some requirement best test cases. Yes. And we link the requirement for those test cases, it's automatically uploaded with the uh, junking to the QM or we need to do the manually. You are saying the, uh, the tracing of the requirements yeah, the so test if I executed and I have the result uh, in the test report as a pass or fail, mm -hmm. and I need to feed back to the QM mm -hmm. 
to uh, make the trussa blade with the requirement. Okay. So junking that can be done automatically when when you are using the tool. Yeah. When uh, outside of the, uh, the Jenkins, I'm saying, when you are having a requirement traceability, I'll take an example as doors. That's a standardly mm. used one. So we are uh, collecting all the requirements from the doors module and. Uh, implementing those requirements and mapping a couple of test uh, requirements to those uh, uh, test cases. Once the test case pass fail result, we can export the result back to the, uh, the doors module. That can be done automatically. So with the vector cast or the... With vector cast. So this server will not support? Because why I, I need to go again with the vector cast? So why this server will not able to do these tasks? Uh, we'll, we'll Catch up okay. on this one. We'll get more information. Uh, okay. well, there is one thing missing that why test tool is needed when there is Jenkins. That's the mm -hmm. standard question I'm getting. We have to have a test tool to make these things happen. We have to have a test cases written on some uh, platform to execute them. That's the standard answer. But anyway, we'll discuss more on okay. uh, your questions. Okay. Any, uh, there's one question here. Are you going to explain about Vectorcast QA as well in the coming session? We have it in uh, the next coming uh, yeah, session. dedicated session on that. Any other questions? Okay. This one at the end. Uh, Harish, okay. Vectorcast is going to generate automatic test cases, right? Yes. So what about the stub parts? It will take care of the stubs for the unit testing? So we are, uh, we are discussing about code coverage. Yeah, so we are. It will go through the, uh, the the distinct part it's going through, and what are the different uh, test cases it has to uh, cover. So that's where uh, the automatic uh, test cases will come through. It will not insert those uh, inputs as a stub. It will automatically stub them, but it will not feed any inputs to those stubs as such. So it's uh, user's uh, job to you know take care of uh, adding those inputs or output from the stub section. But the motive is to get the source code coverage with the automation uh, uh, part of it. So it will insert the inputs. What are the uh, the necessary inputs to uh, to cover that piece of code? And second question, Harish. In Vectorcast Manage, I observed, for example, there is file uh, file dot c. Yeah. Uh, there is some certain point for our testing purpose. We need to modify that file. Some other requirements with the file dot c only. Some test cases has been ran, mm. and in, in that file, some other requirements we need to modify that file to perform our testing due to some certain limit. Yeah. Okay. So when we have the vector cast manage report, it creates as the underscore one and underscore two reports. Is there vector cast will combine those report as a future and generate as a combined report for the particular file? Uh, yes, we'll uh, we'll we'll get to, we'll discuss more on that. Uh, you know, I think uh, there's the in the vector cast manage it will combine and give you the t uh, test result for both file one and file two. Okay. Yeah. And the uh, in, in, uh, no, we know we'll we'll discuss more on that. We'll discuss more. Any questions? Uh, okay. There's one at the end. Ravi is getting the mic to you. Thank you. Hi, Harish. Hi, Abhishek. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is specifically regarding Jenkins, mm -hmm. and second one about the overall licensing aspect. Yeah. So uh, I, I, wh I, what I was following that uh, you have when you install this. Uh, Vector cast plugin, you get a dedicated set of jobs to be made available, and user can create his uh, jobs, Jenkins job from that. Yes. But does uh, unlikewise other Jenkins plugins, which can be integrated in existing jobs for the additional functionality, these jobs, the the vector cast jobs, are from start to end not letting control given to any other. Uh, Intermediate activity. Correct. Okay. So, does Jenkins plugin of Vectorcast can be integrated in existing Jenkins pipelines, jobs, or the uh, simple simple jobs, or user always need to use the dedicated uh, jobs provided by the Vectorcast? Not the ded dedicated jobs. Can you please elaborate? So, so we can create a single job, yeah. and we provide the the path of your managed uh, managed project. That's no, all. correct. So if you can click on this dashboard. Mm -hmm. So let me reiterate. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, uh, the different kind of jobs provided by Vectorcast plugin is a I, part I got your question. I'll answer. Yes. Uh, the Jenkins plugin is not provided by, uh, it's created by Vec Vector Team, but it is available in Jenkins website itself. You can download it from uh, Jenkins Marketplace, where you normally download anything like Blue Ocean or anything. Just like that, you can download uh, Vectorcast and you can install it. So it is maintained by Vector Team, but it is available in uh, Jenkins Marketplace. No, that's, that's absolutely, I understand, because any plugin f which is to be installed in the Jenkins, it should be made available in the Jenkins plugin marketplace. But my question is, if I, uh, if I click on this vector cast, I can select this one of the three options, and I can only create my jobs in, with a guided way what these jobs are allowing me, yes. correct? Yes. Uh, but we also have a default flow. For example, if I have an existing jobs, uh, regression jobs are available, and I want to integrate the vector cast plugins configurability there. Is it allowed? Yeah, I think we'll we'll take it as a uh, notes, and I'll I'll definitely check on this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the second question is about the licensing. So maybe do we have a sep? some session or a part of the session we discuss about the licensing aspect of the vector cast uh, that, that we could take offline because we also have some time for the demo areas and all so during that time perhaps we can discuss it in detail okay but we don't have a dedicated session considering there are so other I will just uh, raise my question just sure, feel, absolutely. Uh, so uh, uh, what I came to know that from my limited knowledge with vector cast so far that uh, you you have every instance of the Vectorcast tool or the Clycast way, it's, it's consuming one license, okay? So if you are creating parallelly multiple instances on the same PC to run your uh, managed projects, you are consuming more than one license at any given point of time. If you open multiple instances of Vectorcast, yes, that's uh, that's right. right. It will have five different uh, nodes open, Vectorcast instances, file license are captured. Perfect. So this, when you somebody is using in the manual way by opening the tool, yes. is there any benefit we see using the plugins that uh, if five people are triggering, because commits will happen anytime. Yes. So what you shown as a one job, uh, one trigger, one commit, it can be uh, committed by many people parallelly, so that you'll see a lot of jobs. And today we executed only one job. This means one license of this PC is consumed. What if five jobs are coming immediately, concurrently? Are they going to consume five licenses or? This is, this is something we need to uh, know more about, uh, uh, Abhishek. I think we'll, we'll get offline. Okay. We, we have uh, that capability. We call it as CI licensing. Okay. So if you want to trigger uh, more than, uh, you know, more than one, mm -hmm. so we, we will discuss with you and we will provide you a CI license at a time how many instances, maximum instances you want to trigger. Okay. And based on that, we will work out the license. Okay. So again, here also it is customer driven. So we will adapt to your workflow again. And yeah. the last question again about... Uh, I know that licensing model of vector cars also have the main feature and some add-on features so that you can have licenses for two add-on feature or four add-on features, okay? I don't see any configurability option in the job to select which kind of license I'm looking for. It's completely uh, based on the, on the PC on which is going to get executed. That's where is the VCM file. Okay. And within the VCM file, okay. you have environments which will have the settings what okay. licenses need to be used. So here, uh, the Jenkins will trigger the build. Mm -hmm. And after that, Vectorcast VCM will take over. Okay. And it will individually run on different environments. And these environments may be using different features. Some may have statements, some may have statement plus MCDC, like that. Okay. So that's where that will come into picture. That okay. licensing will come into picture. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There's one more question. Okay, so we'll take the last question and then we'll break. You can use this. One. I am integrating to this vector cast tool. Okay, so after that, each and every level required low level design. At the state, I am obtaining the result. So in your demonstration, you've shown uh, what test cases affected. So unaffected like that. Whether yes. all the test case IDs and all requirement IDs can able to. 
put it there. So that means I want entire V model so that traceability is possible. I am so showing all the, all during the requirements, report. All the requirements, requirements tab in the yeah. report where what are the requirements you are mapping to those test cases yeah. will be listed down there. Yeah. So you can get to know what are the requirements you are uh, being tested. Okay. So that so option is there. Is there, is it? Yes. So if you integrate it and you bring it in report. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so 